Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This time of year, it is not hard to think about family and friends. As family and friends gather around the, the Christmas tree this past weekend, as family and friends gathered around the table, it's nice to be part of a family. But do we ever slow down and think about those who are outsiders, that are not part of a family, who, who feel lost and not part of a, a group that, that loves them? And you might be thinking, this is kind of a hard thing to think about, uh, right, coming right off of Christmas. You're, you're probably thinking, that it's not very joyous to think about outcasts and people who, who don't have a family. You might think that's not very happy to think about as we come off of Christmas. But I think it's an important thing for us to think about, for us to, to, to ponder and, and to think about those who are outsiders, people who, who do not have a home. And, and I think that maybe the easiest way to think about this, and it's not a, a pleasant thing to think about, are in regards to children. Well, when you have children who are orphans, people who are outsiders, people who don't have a home or a family to call their own. I found this online. There was two questions. Do orphanages still exist in America? And how many orphans are in the U.S.? Are common questions you may hear people ask about considering that there are an estimated 10 million children living in institutions and more than 60 million children living on the streets today. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word orphan as a child deprived by death of one or usually both parents. However, according to Wikipedia, most children who live in orphanages are not orphans by dictionary standards. Rather, today, four out of five children in orphanages worldwide have at least one living parent and most having some extended family. Could, could you imagine being one of these children, one of these kids that essentially doesn't have a home, doesn't have a family, and it's amazing to see that they even by statistics, have a parent that is even alive, and there may be circumstances why they can't have the child or whatever, but these children are left on their own, either in the streets or in kind of these programs that try to take care of them. How would you feel if you were one of those kids? You'd probably desire to have a family. You'd probably desire to have someone adopt you and love you, You'd probably desire to not be an outsider or an outcast or feeling like you're just on your own. Well, today we hear that we need to be loved. We need to be cared for. We needed someone to come into this world to call us his own, to be made part of his family, to change us from being slaves into sons and daughters of his. Today we, we get to jump into the birth of John the Baptist, but as we're driving along in, in our time-traveling car, we have in our rear-view mirror, as we look into it, we can't miss but see Zechariah in the temple. When Zechariah was in that temple, an angel appeared to him and told him, you and Elizabeth, in your old age, are going to have a son, a, a, a child. But as we look in that rearview mirror and that event, we can't help but miss what Zechariah said and how his response came about. So we hear, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. In Zechariah's response, we get a sense of skepticism. In Zechariah's response, there's a hint of doubt. Will this actually happen? How can this come about? Instead of giving God praise, he questions it. And for this, God makes him not able to speak. 
But as we look in that rear view mirror, not to our surprise, Elizabeth becomes pregnant and is expecting a child. And we got to visit this child, so to speak, when Mary visited Elizabeth, and that child leaped for joy. Elizabeth sang a song of praise, and so did Mary. But now we get to look through the front windshield and see that this child came into this world. This child was born of Elizabeth. And what a special thing that was. We are told. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared in her joy. You, You probably could understand their excitement. You probably could understand everyone's joy that that these people who are in their old age, who who are expecting never to have a child, finally were holding a baby boy. Everybody had to rejoice. Everybody was joyful. However, we, we need to keep traveling along in our car, looking through the front windshield, and we'd actually travel eight days ahead. And there, all of a sudden, we see a a ceremonial practice that happens. And on this day, the child receives his name. And what name would he receive? On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. It it seems like a lot of people were excited to hear what would this child be called? What would this special child be named? And already maybe the family relatives and neighbors and friends were already thinking, oh, he's going to be called Zechariah the second. Or or maybe he would be given the name of his great-great-great-great-grandfather. But then all of a sudden Elizabeth spoke up and says, no, 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 no. His name is going to be John. But everybody is like, what? John? Well, why, why would you name him John? No one in your family is named John. And so they, they turned to his, his father, Zechariah, to see what he would say. Well, what would his name be? And they kind of give the signs as we hear. Because obviously Zechariah can't speak. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a, a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judah, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord ha- Lord's hand was with him. So, John it was. John was the name the, the, of the child. And once... Zachariah said that name, he was able to speak again. Joy came from his heart, and he could talk to his loved one, he could talk to his little baby boy that he now held in his hand. But what would Zachariah say? How would he respond after being mute for so long, what, what was on his mind when he, he thought about the angel and now holding his child? What words would come out of his mouth? Well, he couldn't help but sing praise. He, he couldn't help but sing to his Lord for all that he has done. And maybe we think, if we are in the mind of Zechariah, he's probably thinking, I wish I would have given this song of praise sooner. Well, when I was heard the message from the angel, but now here was his chance to give that song of praise. A song we get to hear today. 
His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophet of long ago. So Zechariah's first words out of his mouth were praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. The Lord is the one who deserves all this praise. The Lord is the one who who has done all this miraculous stuff for my family. The Lord is the one who deserves praise because he is caring for his people. The Lord is the one worthy of praise because the Lord, the Savior of the world, is here. Even though he had not been born yet and was still in the virgin's womb. But this was the Lord, Zechariah praised. The Lord Almighty, the Lord of great power, the Lord who delivers his people and gives them salvation. The strength of the Lord has saved his people from the hands of his enemies. We hear salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. God's people were slaves. They were slaves to Satan, the sinful world, and their sinful flesh. They were imprisoned by this, by their human nature. They had the shackles around them, and this enemy wanted them to know they were in control, that they had power over them, that they were their slaves, and they had to listen to them. This was the sad existence that God's people were in because of the sinfulness that they were born with, the sinful world that they came into. These enemies wanted to keep control. They wanted to keep those shackles on. They wanted God's people to know God does not love you. He does not love who you are, and we are in control of you. But God told his people, you are mine. You are my children, and I I love you. We see God deliver his people from Egypt and slavery, but God would deliver his people from sin, Satan, and the devil. God would deliver them from all these things by the one who came into the world, the one Zechariah was prophesying about, the one that Zechariah was praising. But it wasn't just the Old Testament people who were slaves to Satan, the world, and their sinful nature. It wasn't just the people uh, that Jesus was walking around that were sinful. No, it was also you and me. We too were slaves to Satan and the sinful world in our sinful nature. Maybe for some of you, you knew a life of slavery. You knew a life that wasn't with God. You didn't know who who Jesus was. You maybe know that life too well. But then, for maybe most of us, we came to faith early on as our parents or grandparents baptized us as children. There was a time when we were slaves. But there is also a time during our lives when we understand this enemy has continued to keep on attacking. This enemy has continued to want to put those cold shackles and chains on us. You feel their pull as they want to try to drag you back into slavery, back into their power and their control. Maybe we know this life too well. But in that despair, in our cry for help, in our cry for deliverance, God hears his people. God had a plan to free his people. 
God had a plan to bring his people back to him, to call them sons and daughters of him, children of God. The Lord whom Zechariah sang about was the one who would save his people. The Lord who, who, who we praise and worship, the Lord whom Zechariah couldn't help but sing to. As we hear the next part of Zechariah's song, picture it as if you were singing it. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Yes, Zechariah himself was saved by that little child. He was saved by from slavery by Jesus himself. Yes, Elizabeth was saved from slavery and made a child, a daughter of God. Yes, even John the Baptist was saved from slavery and made a son of God. And that also includes you and me. We were made children of God, sons and daughters of his, all because of that little child that we praise and rejoice in that we just celebrated this past weekend that came into this world for you and me, our Savior, Jesus. The one who would grow up and die for your sin and my sin, for the sin of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and John and Abraham and Adam and Eve and the entire world. Jesus would be the one to make us his own, all by his death and resurrection. This is why we confess and believe in the what does this mean of the second article. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did, that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. What a blessing it is. We can worship and praise our God who has called us his own. Well, what a blessing it is that we could be his sons and daughters now and for all eternity. What a blessing it is that we are not outsiders, that we are not slaves, that we are not outcasts, but we are part of his family, a family that he protects, a family that he cherishes, a family that he watches over. As children of God and people that are part of his family, we praise our Lord today like Zechariah. We praise our Lord from the center of our hearts and lives for all that he has done. But as we approach a new year, as we think about the new year that is to come, maybe there's a lot on your mind as you think about what will happen in 2022. Oh, what is going to happen with the world? What is going to happen with my health or the health of others? Will I die? Will someone I love die? There might be a lot of worries and concerns. But the thing is, we can trust our Lord. We can trust our Heavenly Father that He is still watching over us like He did last year and this year. Everything works out to His plan and His will. That in the end, He, he might use a variety of things to deliver His people from this earth to their heavenly home. So as people of God, as sons and daughters of His, we will trust Him. We will have faith in Him. We will continue to worship him and praise him now and forever. 
May the Lord be praised. May we worship him and give him glory in our lives and trust him through the trials that we will face. This is our God. This is our Heavenly Father. This is our Lord and family. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.